All right, how about we move on? Uh, we don't have anything. <laughs> Guys, we have a very special guest tonight. I've talked about it a few times. His name is Mike Legg, and he's the president and co-founder of Petroglyph Games. But he's been in this industry for 20-something years, and it's going to be so cool to talk with him about Grey Goo, a game coming very soon. We're going to check out the trailer first right here. Now, as I was saying, they worked, they used to be Westwood. He used to be at Westwood, uh, Mike Legg, and he worked on Command & Conquer, which is like, almost like the father of RTS in some ways. Mm -hmm. And that's, really when I look at this, there's a little bit of gameplay from some uh, new dev diary demonstrations and stuff like that. That's the first vibe you get, is that uh, is this, this has those Command & Conquer. Uh, no, this yet. is now online. They have this on their official website, guys, okay. greygoo.com. Um, Kristen, could you put up the banner for uh, for Mike Legg in a moment? Um, but yeah, guys, check out greygoo.com. Um, see some of the videos they put up, because they've done uh, some dev stuff, um, mm -hmm. some demonstrations on Twitch and whatnot to show off the game recently in the last week or so. So oh, really? they're getting into their push now, because it comes out early next year. Right. Uh, and now we get to talk to That's Mike Legg about that. Lovely. Let's uh, Let's go to Skype real quick. I'll sign back in. And uh, let's see if we can get a hold of them real quick. Guys, everyone be professional right now, okay? Yeah, because we're talking with a president. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be awesome. All right. Let's gonna search them real quick. All right. Maybe I should take my giraffe hat off. All right, here we go. Come over now. Hey, Mike, can you hear me okay? Hey, I can hear you guys fine. Can you oh, hear me okay? I hear you great, man. Uh, we're just waiting on some video from you. Uh, if you have it, of course. I know that... It, it oh, wait. Be... Hold on. Let me check. We, I do have video going here. There we go. There it comes. We got it coming? There we go. Hey! Oh, All my right. God, it's a parrot! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's Nacho. 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 <laughs> nice. All right, Mike. Uh, thank you so much for coming on to our show, the Level Up Show. This is really special for us because we've we've ta we talked with a few other people that uh, that know you, Mike Emerson, Chris mm -hmm. Rubier. Um, awesome dudes. Uh, yes, exactly. And it's it's just really cool to talk with you now. I got to thank Mike Emerson, of course, yeah. for connecting us with you. Really cool guy, and uh, he's been supportive of our show in the past. Oh, Mike is Mike is just the coolest, nicest guy. He is one of the nicest people I know. And you yeah. seem like a really nice guy. Every time I talk with you, you were just you seem like the most chill and relaxed guy in the world. You have a you have like a bird on your shoulder right now. Just walking around, he's like looking like that. There he is. Yeah, that's <laughs> Nacho. Yeah, and, that, and because of that, that might not be what some people really envision when they think of a president of a large game studio. So how did this happen? How did you rise through the ranks from your humble beginnings to now? Well, let's see. Um, it started, okay, so I've been doing this now for uh, 28 years, and um, I started in the mid-80s uh, actually programming in high school, and uh, me and my buddy Rich wrote um, an Apple II game, a hockey game on the Apple II, and uh, we had some friends that had just started up Electronic Arts, and we took, uh, we took our game to EA, and uh, at that point, they weren't really doing any sports games yet. And so um, there was no EA Sports. And uh, anyways, but we got job offers to start at EA after we graduated out of high school. And uh, we ran back. We told our parents that we we're going to go start working at EA. And uh, then our parents uh, said, no, we're going to college because that wasn't a real job. And uh, anyways, so uh, we got to about, so uh, we agreed to do college, and then um, 1986, uh, I met Brett Spray and Lewis Castle. They were just getting Westwood Studios started, Yeah. and uh, and that's where we got going. And uh, what was kind of cool was my first project was 
with our Petroglyph CEO, Chuck Krogel. He was running a company called Strategic Simulations back uh, at that time. And uh, my first project was on the Atari ST uh, doing a game for SSI, and that was 28 years ago. And then uh, now, at, as of today, Chuck is our uh, our CEO. Very cool. That's awesome. That is awesome. Uh, yeah, I mean, Westwood, I mean, so many people know Westwood for the Command & Conquer series. And I want to go back to Chris Rubier because I remember asking Chris, because he was, you know, he was involved in so many of them, what was his favorite Command & Conquer to develop, but also, of course, to play? And he said Generals. Now, I kind of wanted to, I wanted to, Get your opinion on that too. Oh what is God. your favorite of the ones that you've worked on, and also which is your favorite to play? Well, I gotta say, I I um, I I had I did I'm primarily a programmer, and even yeah. at Petroglyph today, I'm still like pretty much my full time job is is uh, software development. I do I do programming, and so uh, while Command and Conquer and well, uh, Doom Two was our first RTS at Westwood. Mm. Okay. Um, I was working on the uh, Kyrandia trilogy, and then uh, Phil Goro, one of our other guys, he was working on Eye of the Beholder. Very and cool. uh, Joe Bostic was leading the charge on on uh, Dune Two, which then which then after that was Command and Conquer. And um, so I was lucky enough; I got to do what was really fun was I uh, really good buddies uh, with the audio guys, and um, I got to do all the death screams for C and C. So uh, this <laughs> Dune Two, all the way through um, Command and Conquer Three. We were working on Command and Conquer Three at Westwood. And I was the lead programmer on uh, CNC three, and um, we, you know, we had a lot of our crew uh, from Petroglyph that was working on CNC three up up to that was where uh, EA decided to uh, relocate us. That's where we started Petroglyph. And um, so what was really cool was after uh, we handed off the project to EALA, and then um, the, it, you know there was quite a long time before the game finally, you know, where Command and Conquer three came out. I was delighted to still hear. Uh, my death screams that <laughs> kept them in the game, which I thought was just hilarious. And, so cool. uh, and it was, but I guess my favorite one for me, I love the red alert universe. I love oh, how crazy yep. and weird science it is. Yep. And, yeah. um, I thought the videos were a ton of fun. Uh, the cat, the characters, everything very tongue in cheek. Tanya. Um, <laughs> and it was just such a blast. And right. so uh, I, I just loved all the weird science there. It was just, it was just such, so wild and fun and imaginative. Right, and there's a lot of people that agree with you, actually. A lot of people in the chat are saying they love Generals and all, but Red Alert 2 was definitely the one that really set it apart for them. And so, you know, you're not alone with liking that, and it shows, I guess, in your fan base, too. Yeah, Red Alert was my first one, so it always had a special place in my heart. And Tanya, and Tesla coils, and all that that good stuff is just going to be And the dogs. And the dogs, yes, uh, definitely. That there is some nostalgia there for sure. Which brings us, of course, now to Gregu. We showed the trailer before uh, calling you up, and I sure I'm sure it built a lot of excitement in the chat room because we also showed a little bit of the new uh, dev this Twitch stuff yeah, that happened yeah. recently, which really kind of calls back to some of that classic. It seems Command and Conquer. Uh, so tell us a little bit about Gregu. Like, what is Gregu and the name itself, and what does that inspire in the game? Well, Grey is a term, um, actually, um, yeah, it's, it's a term for uh, nanos, nanotechnology run amok. Okay. It's, it's a term for, um, from what I understand, it's a term where if nanotechnology or nanobots self-replicated upon themselves and continued to self-replicate, what would be the physical manifestation of that? And the term uh, that kind of scientifically came about, I don't know how official it is, but uh, the term is gray goo, and uh, because it's very amorphous and almost kind of like wet cement, very liquid-like, and um, so that's the uh, that's the core, you know, that's the core concept behind it is that we have this all new faction, uh, which is the goo. Um, yeah. The game is a um, we call it a modern RTS with a with a real shout out back to the classics, and um, this is the game, uh, an RTS game that is the closest like kind of taking us back to our CNC roots uh, that we've done. Because as we progressed through the years, you know, um, publishers have always encouraged us to innovate and kind of change and break the model and and, and uh, try new uh, new weird ideas. And um, this one's really fun because when we got together with the Gray Box guys, they, they were like, let's take it back to old school. They're like, let's Let's have a game with modern, all the modern, you know, nuances of, you know, DirectX 11 and Internet Play and, you know, Steam integration and, and all the good stuff that we have today. Um, but very classic RTS style gameplay, you know, where we focus, 
like I said, three very unique, different playing factions and uh, bringing back, you know, more focus into like, you know, base building. Yeah. And um, and then also, um, let's see. Um, it Well, basically, yeah. So like that kind of just taking it, t- kind of taking it back to the roots. We put in a LAN party mode so you don't even have to be connected to the Internet. If oh, you're right, having great. a LAN party at your house, you yeah. can play that. Awesome. And uh, yeah, so that's so that's what it is. We're just like a really modern RTS, but like really having fun taking it back to old school. Now, is the goo specifically that that faction? Would you say that differentiates it from the other RTS games out there? Is that your big? Is that your big separation? Yeah, that is a really wild one. I mean, we have the human faction, we have the beta faction, and we have the goo faction. Yeah. And the beta faction is very, you know, they're kind of like your very jack of all trades, you know, style faction. I think they'll be the one that people are most familiar with. And then we have the human faction, which are the humans that are, you know, very evolved, you know, into the future. Since the game's a science fiction game and takes place in sure. the future, um, we've got that. And uh, the humans have some really, really kind of fun, cool nuances about them tech-wise. But then the goo is the weirdest, coolest, bizarre faction we've ever done. And it's even um, – the goo even in the game is not a rendered, modeled, textured, animated mm-hmm. um, – uh, uh, it's completely uh, – when it's in its – when it's in its um, amorphous phase, it's completely um, – it's goo. It, it, it uses uh, a metaballs technology and flocking algorithms, and we had a guy named Eric Yiskis. He worked on it. He's one of our tech directors. He yeah. worked on it pretty much full time of how the goo you know, climbs around, how it traverses the, tra- uh, the terrain, how it grows, how it shrinks, how it blows apart. And um, you know, so the goo is very weird. Now, once you, <laughs> once you decide – a hard choice that you want to make with the goo, like what type of units you want to make. Like you might want to make artillery or you might want to make, you know, scout units or you might want to make, you know, um, you know, um, tank style units. You can then choose to morph your goo into more of a solid form and that'll okay. morph into those, those kind of units that now they cannot morph back into the kind of the liquid, the liquid state that is, oh, that is okay. goo. So it's like and, a T-1000, uh, so, you stuck right. that way. <laughs> and there's, and there's, it's really amazing too because there's no, um, there's no really base building for the goo, oh, okay. so it's always, it's always on the move, and it's always eating. It consumes everything, so uh, it consumes enemy units, it consumes enemy bases, it consumes resources on the map, uh, it grows, it spreads apart. So when you're playing goo, when you start playing it, it feels very much like the easiest action to play because you have one goo and you just move it around and you start consuming. Sure. But eventually you start realizing that, man, when you're controlling like nine different mother goos across the map, that's a lot to keep track of. And so it's a pretty uh, pretty finesse style faction to play for an RTS. That sounds so interesting. Yeah, it sounds very complicated. I mean, what you were saying before about the way that moves around, you can see that from the, the dev, uh, yeah. the behind the scenes dev stuff that you guys put out uh, recently. Uh, oh yeah, it's, fun. it's so much fun, especially the way it just goes over. It just it climbs right. over any terrain. And so for somebody, just, I, I played can, other ones, and you know, it's very basic. You know, for instance, Starcraft is one of the ones that comes to mind. I know it's not, you know, yeah. but like you know, you need to move your base. It lifts up in the air, and the one unit just moves across the screen and then drops down. This, it was very advanced in the way not only it moved, but in the graphics that and the the stuff that you had, the technology you guys had to use behind it. Something that you know, ten years ago, you guys realistically wouldn't been able to do not in the way that you've been able to do it now so yeah it was really a wild problem to solve i mean that yeah. was our that was our biggest head scratcher when we started was how are we going to create this stuff you know and how are we going to make it move and how are we going to make it look and uh that was definitely like a big technical challenge and a lot of you know a lot of fun to kind of figure out how that was going to work now uh you mentioned Graybox earlier who are of course publishing the game and we're always very interested in the publisher developer relationship and we, we wonder how that works exactly mm-hmm. like for instance you at Petroglyph, do you guys have this idea for Gregu and then you have to shop that around to publishers? Or is this an idea that Graybox has and they're like, we got to find the developer that is capable of making this the way we want them to make it. And that's why they came to you. What happens yeah, it's, there? It's kind, of a, it's kind of a mix like that through, <clears throat> through our years, you know, you know, both Westwood and Petroglyph. You know, half the time it's some new idea that we kind of scheme up and we take it and we shop it around and somebody jumps onto it and says, hey, this is really cool. And then other times, you know, publishers come to us with an idea and go, hey, what do you guys think about this? I mean, that was like when we started uh, Star Wars Empire at War. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. the first game with Lucas. Um, we had just started the company and we were we went to them to go pitch um, a new uh, game concept that we wanted to do. And then they were like, oh, no, 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 no. We want you guys to make a full Star Wars RTS, you know, with space combat and land combat and, you know, a galactic level. And we were like, 
awesome, let's do it. And so that's how that kind of kicked off. So with Grey Goo, um, the Grey Box guys had this idea. They, they won, they wanted to make, like I said, they wanted to make a, um, you know, kind of a throwback RTS that really kind of took us back to the roots that, that what people always thought was fun, you know, about real time strategy. They wanted to kind of pull that back and make people yeah. kind of be reminisced about what was, what was fun about RTS and what, what they loved about classic RTS and then, but, you know, like I said, with the modern, modern technologies and they came to us and they, they had the idea for doing, um, this, this whole, you know, this whole sci-fi storyline. It's a really epic story. And they pulled in uh, Weta. We've been working with Weta Workshop oh, wow. on this in New Zealand. And that's been really cool too. So they've been kind of helping kind of, kind of craft the ideas for like the alien races and the world and the terrain and the biosystems and, and kind of how everything works. So in this case, it was something that they kind of shot to us, and then we kind of ran with the pitch and, and, and pitched it back at them. Yeah. And um, it was great because they went through 30 developers, they said, and they slowly narrowed it down. And it was really fun because we get these reports like, well, you're in the top 20, and then you're in the top 10, and you're in the top 5. And, and it was like uh, – it was quite a nail-biter you know, because we were making it so far along. And then finally they said, hey, we chose you guys. That's got to be a huge ego boost in a way because, I mean, right. they, they got this idea and you guys are the prime candidate. You have the pedigree to make this the best RTS that they could have imagined. And that, that's got to be awesome for you. Yeah, it was it was so awesome. And, you know, when we met with those guys, it was like kindred spirits. I mean, they came out, they visited us, and then we went and visited them in Houston. And, you know, it was like getting together with fellow gamer friends. Nice. I mean, we had – we loved the same movies. We loved the same comic books. We loved the same board games. We loved the same computer games. You know, it was just like getting together – with buddies, you know, like to just get together and hang out on the weekend. And we just had this incredible bond with those guys that we were, we were so, you know, in sync in terms of like our cultures and how we all, you know, what, what we liked and, and the type of people too. They're, they're incredibly, you know, awesome people. They're super hardworking. I've never seen a publisher work so hard at a trade show. You know, I've been through two PAXs with them and I've been through Gamescom with them. And now we've got next year's slate coming up and, these guys are just, they are, it's all about the games with these guys. They, you know, they're, they care more about quality than anything else. And they care always number one, what is going to make the game awesome, you know? And so, and then they, they just, they're so great because they let us run wild creatively too. You know, they don't want us, you know, burdened down with certain limitations. You know, they're, they're like, they want us to just, you know, to focus on making the best thing that we can make. And so uh, we absolutely love working with them. They are just a blast. That's awesome, man. Um, I was I was actually a little curious. I remember when you, you guys first put out the first trailer for this. Um, it was it was very odd, uh, just in the sheer fact that all you saw was the gray goo, you know, shooting down from space onto a planet with you know different creatures that kind of look like elk or something like that. And there was a lot of talk like, oh, is this you know prehistoric? Is this back you know early times? You know, so my question is, and this happens a lot with you know developers making games. They hear all the talk and the rumors about what their game is going to be like. What is it like for you, you know, as a president of the company and everything like that, seeing all the rumor talk and being like, oh, you guys have no idea what's up our sleeve. Oh man, it, it's awesome. I mean, I am I am so uh, blessed every day because you know, like I said, most of the time, you know, I'm working in the code. Um, I work I work primarily like on our audio technology with Frank Klopaki, who's our okay. who's our composer, and um, I work on our technology council. So, and I've you know from from day one of Petroglyph, I <clears throat> you know I've worked on writing our our engines and our technology and everything. And um, I come in and I'm just humbled and blown away by how. I see like what the art team is doing or what, you know, the design team is up to or what kind of new uh, music that Frank is creating. And it's just, you know, and then also from a, from a technology point of view, you know, the, the, the technology that, you know, the, uh, the programmer team, you know, is creating is just, um, I'm just constantly humbled because man, you know, we're, we're always learning new things yeah. and, uh, you know, we're always adapting, we're always learning and getting better. And, um, yeah, it's just been amazing. It's a, it's such a cool thing because I can't wait, you know, for everybody to jump in and you know, j you know, start playing this and be able to start playing this with, you know, with people. Yeah. And for me, um, I'm a, I'm a turtler. I love turtling in RTS. I love building <laughs> bases, and so I love the human faction. And I'm really excited because you know we can now. I love the idea that I can play co-op with friends, and we can, and I can turtle and uh, and play play with the public. You know, yeah. I have one. Final question for you, but I hope that you don't take it the wrong way because you guys obviously you have this pedigree in RTS and people respect that for uh, you know for you for that and they know you for that. 
But I'm wondering, since you've done this genre for such a long time, is there any desire to branch out to another genre? And if so, what is the one genre that you would like to go into a little bit? You know, it, it's funny. We are, we love strategy games, you know, um, we, and we love, you know, I mean, that's our expertise, you know, I mean, we, at Petroglyph, you know, we've done, you know, we've done some turn-based strategy and real-time strategy and, and uh, we, you know, we love strategy games. Um, we're also huge, you know, RPG fans and yeah. we've got, you know, we've got guys at the office that have done, also done work on, you know, on RPG because there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of crossover between RTS and RPG. So if we were going to go away, I'd love to make an XCOM style game too. Oh, I love, love XCOM. Cool. Yeah. Wow, it's just so cool. And I love, I love turn-based strategy. So that would be awesome. Um, but I think it would also be a blast to make a, you know, like a, an, a you know, a really cool RPG as well. Cool. Very cool. Uh, we have some people in the chat that were asking a couple things. I mean, the one is probably the most, co the one I was anticipating everybody in the chat you know, asking, and they, they, everybody just wants to know, they love your series, and other companies have tried to do it, do you guys have any plans on trying to port any Command & Conquer titles over to console, you know, PS4, Xbox One, anything like that? Oh, you mean bringing over CNC? Yeah. yeah. Well, we, you know, we don't, uh, you know, see, e Electronic Arts owns the, the EA, yeah, uh, the, right. I'm sorry, CNC license, and we, you know, we, we've talked to them before about how we would love to you know get back into that franchise you know we've got you know joe bostic who who is our creative director at petroglyph he was like the original you know cnc co-creator and um you know we love that world so much and uh we we've uh you know we've approached ea at times you know and just say hey you know keep us in mind if you guys you know want to do this you know they they had the uh victory studio you know that which closed down and they were working on the next cnc sure and it, they just scrapped it you know and we we're and uh, so we, um, yeah, that's something we would love to jump back in and do. Um, we have done console in the past. In mm -hmm. fact, we were working on, uh, we had a game um, called Universal War Earth Assault that played on Xbox 360 and it played on PC interconnected on X for, Win um, I'm sorry, on uh, Games for Windows Live. Okay. Uh, which ends up. Uh, just games with this life just ended up not being a very good thing. Yeah. And so <laughs> nobody cared that the games were interoperable, but we had it playing on console and right. you could, you know, you could play it with a console controller and man, it is so hard to make an RTS work um, on a console. We, right. we worked yeah. with, we, we, uh, one of our interns, he was over working on uh, Halo Wars. And so we were talking with the Halo Wars guys and we were talking with EALA cause they were working on Red Alert 3 uh, for I think PlayStation Three at the time, and we were all trying to come up with a, like a shared control scheme that was set like an industry standard. And um, I think everybody did really good jobs with it, but nobody's really nobody's really nailed it. And it just it just feels like RTS on a console. It's got to be designed from the ground up for console control. And branching it just, off of you know, that, can't, we can't emulate like a mouse keyboard style game. Yeah, I was kind of wondering branching off of that. It, do you think like Smart Class or the touchpad on the PS4 controller? I mean, or... The benefit now, and uh, sorry, not to. But the benefit now is you do have the consoles that support mouse and keyboard. Yeah. You know, PS4, for instance, does, it does support it. So I'm hoping to see something like that. And I think that's actually why so many people are asking to see one of your, you know, great RTS games. You know, yeah. just, you know, port over yeah. to the console or something. Yeah, we did. We did. We did focus tests into that back when we were working on uh, Universe at War, and EA did the same thing. They were looking into uh, the, the similar thing, and what we found is like the enthusiasts like us. We would totally play with mouse and keyboard on our consoles. You know, sure, we'd be yeah. willing to set that up. But most gamers, what they found at the time was, would would the, most gamers wouldn't even bother plugging in mouse and keyboard. They just say, hey, you know what? Let's it just go play on the P PC. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Right. <laughs> gamers can be a little lazy sometimes, or they just don't want to look into. Uh, yeah, I, mean, play I would play. love it. I'd do it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, all the hardcore, as you said, enthusiasts would definitely do it. Uh, of course, I want to end mm -hmm. this on Grey Goo above all else. Uh, we want to know when does it come out, what systems, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's uh, Steam through yeah. PC, of course, right, with Grey Goo? Yeah, it's PC. It's PC Steam right now. That's that's when we've announced so far, and it's coming out very, very early, early 2015. So we've pretty much got it all in the can, and it's coming really, really, really soon. Is there any beta plans for Grey Goo at all? They're currently, they're currently, we're still kind of analyzing the options on that, and okay. it hasn't been completely locked down. We had an alpha test, which we gathered a ton of great information from. We had the fans, the fans helped us a lot in the alpha, and then we've done a lot of focus test groups. So we've had a lot of like private testing, and then on top of that, we've had a lot of testing done like at the trade shows. We've got a lot of feedback, and we've responded to all that feedback. So 
Um, the the Xbox, oh, no, sorry, Xbox, Great Box, you know, <laughs> still, is still looking at options for that, but we're getting, you know, we're getting so close now. Sure, yeah. So, um, you know, we just got to kind of get that, you know, we got to get all that locked down and stuff like that. In fact, we were just discussing it last week even and stuff. But it's just, you know, with matching, you know, because we've already responded to a ton of the feedback. And as we go live, we're still going to keep re- responding to the feedback. You know, we're going to be, you know, we're going to be continue to do content launches and mm-hmm. downloadable content. And we're going to be adding, you know, we're going to be releasing our map editor so people can create custom maps. Oh, that's great. We're going to be releasing some of our other tools for the, you know, the modding community. So the game won't stop at Grey Goo. I mean, we are primed and, and pumped to just keep going and, uh, you know, working on the title and the franchise. Is there any... Uh trade shows coming up or conventions that our viewers can look forward to maybe seeing great go at oh yeah man pack south okay. yeah, i think january 23rd and in, in, in um where's it san antonio okay there okay. you go yeah. It's going to be there full tilt. I mean, we we've had it at we've had it at you know PAX East and PAX Prime and um, Gamescom this year, and we had a total blast, and we met so many awesome you know gamers. And uh, now now because um, Graybox is based out of Houston, so they are fired up that they're actually having a PAX. You know, right. gosh dang, you know December January. I mean, we're not that far away. No, you know, not at all. Right. Okay. And uh, yeah, it'll be it'll be full on at at Pack South. I'm sure a lot of our uh, chat room viewers right now are happy about that. Right, and if you ever get to the East Coast for Pax East, I don't know if you go there. Hopefully, we get to run into you there. That would be great. Oh, check out. We went we went out for Pax Boston, and we had a blast, and just awesome people, great vibe, and uh, man, it was just it was just so much fun. Awesome, man. Well, hopefully we get to run into you this year, maybe. But yeah, that would be amazing. Else, true? Um, I think Puss was saying something in the chat room, but I'm not sure if he's joking what? or not. He says that he needs a key code for Red Alert 2 because he lost his. No. <laughs> no. What? Is that a joke? Uh, yeah, yes. I think it's a joke. I think he lost you his. Have, you know what? Have him email me. You guys got my email. I mean, it's pretty easy email to figure out, obviously. But um, <laughs> you guys, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead and email me. And I'll see what I can track down. <laughs> Uh, well, you are the nicest man. guy, man. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to talk with you. I'll tell you what, man. The, the whole command of, between Chris, yo, Mike, and Mike, I mean, that team must have been awesome for all you guys to work together and probably everybody else that works. So you guys seem like a really, you know, fun, chill, you know, very down-to-earth group of guys. So. Oh, uh, I love those guys, too, man. Mike and Chris are just so awesome, you yeah. know, and, and uh, I think did, and I think Chris told you guys the story about how he started a video. He was working at, like, a video rental yeah, store. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He was working, he was working with uh, Ted Moore who's the executive producer on Grey Goo. That's where... Uh, oh, that's wow. Where Ted, Ted was the video store manager, and that's where Chris got his start. That was <laughs> small that world. So funny. Uh, he said he even a smaller world, you know, like Joe Kukin who plays Kane. This is a funny story. I, he and I went to high school together, and so that's where kind of he got his start, you know, into Westwood and everything with Joe. So... Um, yeah, it's just kind of funny. People are like, you went to high school with Kane? And it's like, yep, and he had a full head of hair. <laughs> <laughs> That's well, so cool. Mike, everybody in the chat loves you. They love not only the time that you've taken out of your day to talk to us, but just the inf- amount of information that you're able to give. And you know, So there's a lot of great feedback for you and your, your series, both past and present. And we can't wait to see what comes out of this and future of Grey well, Goo and you guys. Well, guys, thank you so much for inviting me on. I'm so glad, you know, Mike you know, made this connection and, uh, you know, I've been really enjoying the show. I've been going back and watching the archives and I watched, and I, and, and the Chris was, it was great. It was a total surprise. I'm like, Hey, there's Chris. That was awesome. <laughs> I was going back through and stuff. So, you know, I just want to say thanks for, you know, the opportunity. And I, I hope we can do more of this stuff with you guys and, you know, just keep up the great work. And I, you know, let's definitely get together and say hi at uh, PAX South, man. Cause I'll, you know, I'll be there the whole time. We'll definitely be at PAX East. <laughs> yeah, maybe not PAX South. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Okay. I'll get a ticket. Go for a day. PAX East also in Boston. Great, because uh, <laughs> we're only we're only uh, on the East Coast here. Yes, we're uh, in Jersey. Right. Yeah, so, but definitely we would awesome. love to meet you, Mike, because you seem like the most chill, down there with guy in the world, and we're so happy <laughs> they came on the show. So thanks again, and uh, take care, man. And Bye, Nacho. Bye, Nacho. Keep up the great work. Oh, and Nacho. There he is. <laughs> <laughs> see you, Nacho. Bye, Mike. Bye. Thanks, guys. Have a good night. You too, you too. man. Oh, sorry, I cut him off there. Uh, awesome. But, uh, yeah, I knew he was going to be the nicest guy. Right. I could tell from every email I had with him that he was just such a chill guy, and it really comes through now right. in, really in our chat. Good. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I know that every now and then, you know, you guys don't really want to hear this kind of information, but I think it's awesome mm-hmm. when we get the chance to talk with actual industry people here. Not, right. I mean, God, this guy's a president of right. a Why studio. You-